While I'm still waiting to tidy up my desk, I'm actually lucky enough to be in California, which is an amazing place for lots of sightseeing. Now behind me you can see this wonderful expanse of El Mirage, an amazing dry lake that is perfect for going super fast in any kind of vehicle. Now while I'm here, I thought I'd answer some more questions. The first question is from Dominica Grace. She asks, what sort of music do I have playing in the workshop when I'm working? Well, actually, when we're making the TV show, we can't have any music playing at all because, of course, you have to keep cutting things backwards and forwards, and that would just mess up the continuity. But as far as what I actually listen to personally, well, it's all kinds of stuff. Quite an eclectic mix, really, depending on what kind of mood I'm in. There's classical music, there's trad jazz, even things like Art of Noise, Van Halen, Prodigy, even Electro Swing, and recently Above and Beyond. Pretty much whatever it is, it's going to get the job done. Now the next question is from Jazz Madden. Now he's asking, are there any cars you'd love to restore or repair that are not cost effective or very difficult to get hold of? Well, perhaps probably the most difficult car I can imagine, and possibly the least cost effective, would be the Damaxian car, um, which is something that a guy called Buckminster Fuller invented way back in the 50s. I think there's like one original one left, and that's in the Reno Car Museum, and they're actually restoring it at this very second. Now, it's a huge, huge project, and of course, there aren't really any manuals or any spare parts available, so that would be an absolute nightmare, but a real challenge and a really wonderful thing to finish off. Now, in addition to that, if you go for all the expensive cars, things like a Cord Phaeton or perhaps some kind of Duesenberg. I mean, the thing is, they might actually be worth doing in the end because, of course, they'd be worth so much money, but they'd be really tough to do. In fact, people like Jay Leno actually have machines in their workshops where they can print or make parts, especially for these really, really rare cars because you just can't find them in scrapyards anymore. Now, other things like a wonderful thing would be to do. My uncle, many, many moons ago, had an old Bentley. And from what I understand, it was taken into business when they were trying to restore it. Unfortunately, the guy restoring it died, and then they had to sell the car. And then a couple of years, later, in fact probably only about five or ten years ago, it was actually seen for sale in an auction in America. I would love to get hold of that car and then have a go at restoring it myself. Now here's a question from Barbara Ampting. Now she asks, I've never had any form of education in the field of car restoring or building, yet I did love watching Wheeler Dealers. It was mainly because you made it sound understandable without treating the viewer like an absolute idiot. Personally, I think that's why it's so appealing to many viewers. Basically, everyone can watch and find something that's interesting. Maybe this is something to consider. Continue to make a car show that's appealing to the bigger audience so we can all learn about car restorations and rebuilding. Well, thank you. That is very high praise indeed. Now, unfortunately, I don't yet know what show I'm going to do next, but whatever it is, I'm definitely going to keep those detailed fixes in because that seems to be what the entire world would like to see. So watch this space. And I have a question from Jeff Kittle. I am six foot one, but as you are much taller than me and lifts generally only lift to six foot, how often do you hit your head on the underside of cars you're working on? Have you ever knocked yourself dizzy? Well, thankfully, not yet, but I have been close. Now, the trick I have found over the many, many years of doing wheeler dealers is to stand a little bit like a rock star doing a guitar solo. So legs really far astride, and that way, of course, you stand a little bit lower, and hopefully then you'll miss everything under the car. But I have to say, if you leave a tire on and hit your head on one of those, they don't seem to go anywhere, and they really, really hurt. Now here's an interesting question from Greg Bewley. I finally got to watch what I believe is your last episode, the 1916 Cadillac. It seemed rather odd to me, and while the mechanical work was interesting as usual, the beginning and especially the abrupt ending was unusual. Any insight as to how that all played out? Well, unfortunately, yes, the episode did end rather abruptly, but then so did the project. We had crammed about two years' worth of work into 15 weeks, and the result, as you saw, was us driving around the wonderful California countryside. Now, unfortunately, a week before that car had to get on a plane to go off to China in readiness for the start of the rally, the network decided to cancel the whole thing, so we never got to go. I then bought the cars off Mike, so I still own them, and I fully intend to iron out all of those little creases and get the car race ready all over again. The 1916 needs to be actually put back together again. The 18's engine needs to be put back into the 18. A lot of work to be done, and if I can find somebody, a co-pilot, who's brave enough, maybe even crazy enough to come with me, then I fully intend to complete that rally in 2019. Watch this space. Well, that seems to be the end of the questions I have here, so now I think it's time for us to enjoy the sunset. <laughs>